So hi everyone, uh, I'm here with Will Gries uh, from the Azure Files team. And um, so we're traveling a lot with Ignite the Tour, right? So I get often asked by a lot of people about Azure Files. They think it's a great tool. It helps them with their file servers, which they deploy around the world to replicate those and use the advantage of using the cloud on their on-prem environment. Um, so you're working on Azure Files, is that correct? Yeah. So, you know, the great thing about Azure File Sync, and it really goes back to kind of what we started with, is this question of really trying to get to where the customer actually was with their data. So, customers have on prem file servers today. Um, and in a lot of cases, really, customers really like their on prem file servers. And so, Azure File Sync is really positioned as a way that um, you can start to take advantage of some of the great things in the cloud, like Azure Backup, like the fast disaster recovery feature of Azure File Sync, without giving up that on-prem experience. I mean, your file server is right down the hall, typically from where your end users yeah. are. So things are really fast. You're ca getting that cache and ability on premises. So yeah, File Sync has been definitely a big hit with customers and and definitely one of our shining spots yeah. within Azure Files. Yeah. Now we hear that a lot when we go out on the tour and we show that. Um, people really love it. And But one question I get a lot is um, some of them, you still need a server on-prem, right? You need to like sync and you have that agent. It's basically caching, as you said, your files there. Uh, but even some of the companies, they want to get rid of that, right? They want to get rid of yeah. um, their on-prem servers at all. Um, and you're here to talk about this. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not surprising we get customers coming up to us saying, hey, you know, I've pitched Azure File Sync to my management. My CTO said no more on-premises servers. Um, and, you know, we do get some customers that will run Azure File Sync against an Azure VM. And that's a great solution if you fit in, you know, into that category of like wanting to do that. But, you know, we look at that and say, oh, that's, that's not the best because it forces you to have to run a server and you're not getting the benefit of the caching, right? You're you're caching the file share it also in Azure. So, um, you know, from our perspective, we really want to be able to transition people to if they're in this boat where they want to deploy Azure Files this way, that they're able to just use the serverless aspect of Azure Files and just ask for a file share and get a file share and go. Okay, that sounds awesome. So, can you show me how that would work? Yeah. So the big thing that uh, you know really has stopped people from doing this in the past and and up until now, uh, makes customers use Azure File Sync as a sort of a stopgap to this is the lack of Active Directory integration for mm -hmm. Azure Files. So at Ignite, we actually announced um, in our session that we're uh, coming out with um, Azure Files Active Directory domain join support, and so uh, that's coming very soon. And basically, the the core of this really starts from domain joining your storage account. Okay. Oh, that sounds pretty cool. And I think a lot of people have been waiting that for a long, long yep. time. It's been a many asked, fe must, much asked fe feature. Um, and so we have that now to be able to show you. Okay. That's awesome. Can you show it to me? Yes, of course. So like I said, the first step here is to uh, domain join the storage account to your domain. Um, and so to do that, I'll show you I have a, a storage account here. Um, and inside of this storage account, I actually have a uh, nice file share yep. um, called test share. Uh, there it is. So this is exactly what we had before, right? It's not something you yep. use like the normal Azure storage account with Azure files as we know it. Yes, exactly. Um, nothing special with this particular storage account other than it's deployed into a region that has a development region that has this okay. functionality enabled. Um, so the next thing I need to do is actually pop open the uh, PowerShell terminal. I'm using the nice Windows terminal app. Um, and I'm going to run uh, the actual domain join. Essentially, I'm doing an offline domain join. Um, so I'll type in the uh, utility uh, PowerShell module we have. Um, and then I'll actually just go straight forward typing in the domain join command. So I'll do join, join az storage account for auth. And I'll type in the information about my storage account, like resource group. Uh, storage account name, all the things that you'd expect. Um, this is sort of standard Azure PowerShell. Um, so is this now connecting to my Azure Active Directory? Yeah. So effectively what this commandlet does is it creates a computer account in your on-premises AD on behalf of your storage account. Um, and while, while we were talking there, actually, I just did that. 
Um, so I've created the computer account. I've set the password on that computer account to be one of our new storage account keys for the storage account called uh, curbkey1. Um, and then I have actually set a special property on the uh, computer account that I just created called the service principal name that matches the storage account's name. Um, and so this enables me to, when I come into my, uh, you know, uh, Windows client, I have my file explorer, I type in the path or I do a net use to mount using my uh, Windows identity. I'll actually pass a Kerberos ticket to the Azure File Service and Azure Files can authenticate okay. and authorize. Okay. Oh, that sounds, that sounds pretty good. Um, so from here, you know, I might be inclined to just jump forward and want to start playing around with the share. Uh, but if you're like most customers and, and, and this demo environment that I have here is like this, you actually can't because most customers actually block the port that SMB communicates over, which is port 445. So to uh, address that, we're actually going to configure some of the advanced networking features of the storage account to be able to tunnel and access over a VPN. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because also not just company blocking that port, but I also heard like service providers blocking the SMB yeah, yeah. port and things. Of, like of that. course. So if you're you know if you're in the position where you're trying this at home, you know you have a, a one of the big service providers um, just as a way to attempt to protect their customers, they've blocked this port mm -hmm. thinking oh, nobody needs to access a file share over the internet except for, you know, you do in this yeah. case. Um, and so this enables you to tunnel over a, a VPN. Okay. I do want to stress that, um, you know, if your organization is willing to open up port 445, there's nothing inherently insecure about doing that. And Azure Files uses SMB3 yep. with encryption. So it's an internet safe protocol. But we're just sort of looking at it from the perspective that, you know, most customers are not wanting to open up this port. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So let's let's move on. So the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to create a private endpoint for the storage account. So this is a great new feature from the networking team. And effectively what it does is it gives your, your storage account a, a NIC, a dedicated NIC with an IP address assigned from inside the address space of a virtual network. So I have uh, my same storage account here um, and I have a virtual network that I want to add a NIC in. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do that. So I'll click into the storage account and I'll uh, navigate to the private endpoint connection um, and click new private endpoint. So I, it's an Azure resource just like anything else. So I'm going to give it a name um, and I actually need to select the region that I want it to be in. Um, so in this case, my VNet is in France Central. So I've selected France Central as the region that I want the private endpoint to be in. Um, so if I advance uh, here to sort of the next step, um, I need to select the, the storage account. Um, so let me see if I can find it in this list. Uh, the good thing is I can I can type it out here because it's not not coming to me. Um, You're dealing with a lot of storage. Yes, it's a shared subscription. I'm sure many of you know that. So uh, I've selected the storage account that I want, and then um, I've actually picked the target resource here. You know, the storage account is a management object in Azure that serves like five different Azure ser storage services. So fi Azure Files is the one that we want here, obviously. Um, and then I go through some of the, the final configuration steps. So I need to select my virtual network and the subnet that I want it in. And then you'll notice I didn't modify any of the settings, but you'll notice this private DNS integration. You know, strictly from the perspective of private endpoints, that's optional. Mm -hmm. But from the perspective of actually using this to connect from on-premises, that's actually a requirement that you have to configure that. Okay. Yeah. Good news is it automatically does it for you, so it's not hard to do. Perfect. But, yeah. Uh, and then obviously just go through and uh, create the create the private endpoint. So it's going to do all the validation and then create, and you'll see in real time here that I'll actually go through and do uh, this private endpoint creation. So after that private endpoint like gets created, um, does that then in that case mean I can access it privately, right? Uh, but does it also block it from like public access? Um, so that's a great question. So inside of your Azure VNet, when you type in the storage account's name, so like storage account.file.core.windows.net, um, that's the, the file endpoint, um, you'll actually be able to resolve the private IP address. So they do that through um, C names and nice DNS. I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Actually. Okay. Um, if you're outside the storage account, simply configuring a private endpoint doesn't prohibit you from connecting to the 
to the actual public endpoint. Um, so there's actually uh, another feature that Azure Storage has called um, firewalls and VNet ACLs. And so you can configure your storage account such that it will reject requests coming from public. Okay, so perfect. So I can do actually both. So if I'm a company who wants to have private access, but also for some reason want to have the public access, I can have both. But yep. if I want to just have the private one now, I can also like just put ACLs on it and basically yep, protect it. that's exactly it. right. And, and actually, we, we've had customers that have expressed both ways. Like, I really need to lock this down and have it go over an express route because I need a deterministic route. You know, um, government and sort of financial customers will say that. Or like, I actually want the public endpoint open because I do want my external users to be able to mount if they're not on my on-premises location. Yeah. All right. So um, I'll show you the resources that we have here. So here's my NIC that I created, and you'll see that I have a private IP address. Um, and then the other uh, main thing I want to draw attention to, I guess before I do that, you'll notice I actually, actually deployed three resources, the private endpoint, the network interface, and the private DNS zone. If I already had a private DNS zone, it would just update the existing one, but in this okay. case, I didn't. Um, so the, the, the one thing I want to really draw your attention to is this private uh, DNS zone. Um, so you'll see I created a record, an A record for this storage account that matches the private IP address. Um, and then this actually turns out to be really important later. So I won't make you wait long, but I'll make you wait one second to show you why this is important. Okay. All right. So the next main thing that you'd have to do here is to set up uh, an express route or a VPN connection. Um, obviously, this is a quite a time-consuming thing to do. Um, not a hard thing to do, um, but it's it's also something that you really only have to do once. You don't have to do it for every storage account. So we're going to skip showing how to do this, um, but we do have documentation we'll provide in the video link. Okay, yeah. Uh, so to... this is exactly how you would do it. There's nothing special about this. This yeah. is like if you have... It's a regular standard express route connection. Okay. And importantly, because you created a private endpoint, you don't have to do Microsoft peering. If you want to do only private peering, you can. You can. Perfect. Okay. All right, so the next thing we need to do here is because we want to access from on-premises, um, we need to actually forward the, um, the Azure Storage DNS zone to be answered by the Azure Private DNS that I just showed you, um, as opposed to being answered by the Azure Public DNS. Yeah. Um, so really what that looks like is, I have a nice slide to show you here. Um, without this, I ask Public DNS for the IP, and then I try to do a request over the public endpoint, and if I block 445, SMB will fail. Yeah. Um, so really what we want to do is we want to do this sort of layer of indirection. We want to hit the um, my on-prem DNS, uh, which hits a DNS server that I set up in Azure, which hits the private DNS, the Azure private DNS service. And you need that layer of indirection of having a DNS server that you run in your Azure VNet um, from the perspective that that Azure private DNS IP is not accessible outside of your Azure VNet. Okay, which makes absolutely sense, right? You want to just change the naming. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, you know, from talking to customers, um, I've talked to a few Azure Files customers that have already set this up for other services, yeah. in which case you can just update your your configuration in place to redirect core.windows.net, or if you're in a, a non-public cloud, um, to redirect the, the endpoint relative to your cloud to the right IP address. Um, but we'll also be providing some some sample ARM templates that will go deploy the DNS okay, for you. Nice. Um, all right. So let's actually look at how to do this. And of course, you have SMB. Um, so here's uh, my view of a window. Uh, my Windows server. I have I loaded a couple of uh, MMCs to actually show you things. So um, what I want to show you first is uh, essentially the um, DNS uh, forwarder. Um, that I've put in on my domain uh, can, domain DNS, is yeah. what I'm trying to say. So um, I have these two IP addresses. Um, I showed the uh, the 192.168.24 and 25. Um, they're actually the servers I set up in Azure. Okay. They point at this, uh, my on-prem points at these servers over the uh, virtual network. Yeah. Um, so I'll flip to my page here. I, I have... Um, those DNS servers that I set up. And like I said, we'll be having an ARM template that configures those for you. Perfect. So I'll flip back to my other view here. And then I'll actually look from one of these DNS forwarders at the, I have a, a similar conditional forwarder for core.windows.net. And that points at the internal IP address assigned 
it's it's actually the same in every vena. It's a special reserved IP address. Okay. Like Azure Networking has. Um, so essentially, what that means is that my on-prem DNS, which I called Contoso AD, um, will redirect requests for anything uh, under the core.windows.net zone to the DNS forwarder zero or DNS forwarder one, which will redirect it uh, core.windows.net requests to that internal private DNS IP. Okay. Um, and then you can actually see the effect of this by uh, typing in the resolve DNS name command. I'll type in my storage account's name. Um, and what I get back is I get back a, a C name record uh, for the public name of the storage account to this private link DNS zone that I created. Um, and then I get back the, that's the, the authority is the private link. And of course I see the IP address that I expected, the, the, the one from the VNet space that I yep. own. So it's a private, it's not usually when you do that, would do that, you would actually get a, a public IP address exactly. back, right? You get the now. public IP of the Azure storage service. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, so one additional thing that I wanted to show here, and this is strictly optional, is that if you have an on-premises server um, that you want to preserve the name for, um, you can actually use DFSN, uh, and a, a nice feature of DFSN called root consolidation, to actually take over that existing name and redirect those requests to your file shares. Okay, so that's basically, especially if I, I, I mean, I probably we have users which have mounted shares and all of that, right? Or like you have in Office, you have um, basically like paths to certain files yeah. to the file server. So with DFSN, and if you configure that, you can basically take over that, that yep, name. Yeah, that's exactly that. right. Uh, I do want to point out, I'm, what I'm showing here is using root consolidation, but you can also do this as, just as easily with a domain DNS. Or sorry, DFSN. It's easy to get those acronyms. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, if you didn't know, DFSN is Distributed File System Namespaces. Yeah. Um, but um, just for the purpose of this, I'm showing uh, the root consolidation. Yeah. So let's look at that. So I've already set this up. Um, you'll notice I have here these two DFSN servers. Um, and if I actually flip back to my view of my Azure portal, you'll see that I have them here. We're going to be providing an ARM template to set these up as well. Um, now, strictly speaking, there's no requirement that these DFSN servers be in Azure. Uh, but, you know, sort of sticking with the scenario that I don't want to provision on-prem servers anymore, this is a mm -hmm. nice way to be able to do it. So um, what you'll actually see here is I have um, the DFSN namespaces. And I have the two servers. You see I have this hashtag my test server. And underneath I have the uh, pointing at the actual UNC path of the storage account. So the reason that hashtag is there is actually that's what you do for the uh, DFSN root consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one more aspect to this, which is I've also put a load balancer in front of this. Um, so there's my IP address. Um, that just lets me uh, sort of balance between these two servers, primarily for the purpose of ensuring that if one of the VMs is down because of an update or whatever, that you still are able to satisfy the, the DNS, yeah. DFSN yeah. direction request. You don't want to point, uh, create a single point of failure, exactly. right? So um, essentially what I've done here is I've created a DNS entry for my test server that points at that IP address for the load balancer. And then the final thing that you do is you mount the file share. So without further ado, let's do that. So here's my client desktop. I'll open um, up a file explorer here. Um, and I'm going to type in the actual direct path, the UNC path of the storage account. Um, so let me type that out. And I'll type out test share. Um, and what you see here is it connected. It used my Windows identity. Um, and then I'm actually going to do the same thing with my uh, DFSN root consolidated server name. So this is a presumably an existing server that I have that I want to take over the namespace for. So my test server and uh, my test chair. Um, you notice the UNC path is totally different, but I get the, uh, the exact same namespace there. And to just prove it, I'll actually go ahead and create a file and show you that it creates the file instantly. I'll name the file and even uh, add some content in it uh, and save it. And when I open it on the other side, it just works. So exactly what you'd expect from a file share. Use my Windows login identity. I didn't have to do any special 
uh, sauce to be able to access this. I just yeah. typed it in. So it looks like it's like your own prem file share, but actually it is the one in the cloud. Where exactly. Use Azure files. Exactly. Awesome. Okay, this is great. Now that I'm super excited about this because, again, as I said, we got a lot of questions around this, and people are super waiting for this. Um, but one question I get now: I mean, having the files there, that's great, right? So I have the files synced. However, is now that Azure File Shares, if I have an identity, can I use like my existing permissions for that? Yeah. So I mean, this is obviously one of the big reasons to want to mount with your uh, Windows logon identity. Um, so basically, when uh, we get your Kerberos ticket as part of the SMB mount, um, we get a list of your SIDs that, you know, the groups that you're in, the, the various user identities that you have. Um, and then we're able to actually authorize against uh, access control list or ACLs that are stored on the file. Okay. So the, it's, the, it's the full thing. It's exactly what you'd expect from a file Yeah. So I can file fully server. replace actually my file servers um, using Azure Files yep. now. Okay, now this is awesome. Thank you very much for being here. So we put all the links and everything in the description uh, of that video. So if you want to know more about it, we have an announcement blog, we have documentation for it. Uh, you can just go out and try it out.